you always realize that our lives are basically encapsulated in all of these sha'at, and all of these rituals that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives to us, right? Like everything Allah gives us, like your salah, and Imam ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah said very beautifully, that it's like the entire salah is an introduction to your sujood. Like you're really building up to the sujood the whole time. The sujood is the most special part of the salah. It's the part that is to capture you. It's the part where your, your heart really the closest that you're going to be to your Lord is your sujood. So literally the rukur is between qiyam and sujood, right? It's literally bowing in between. The day of Arafah, so this is what I was reflecting on. When Arafah starts, everyone's so enthusiastic, like people are out there, they start their du'as, and then like, you know, three o'clock, four o'clock, people are like kicking back, you know, eating their lunch, eating their ice cream, sort of waiting for, uh, you know, trying to cool off a bit. And then like the last hour of Arafah is the most beautiful hour of Arafah. Like you see everyone engaged in du'a. Like, I mean, there's still some people eating ice cream, but you know, like you see, for the most part, the last hour of Arafah is so special. And with Ramadan, you start off so energized, enthusiastic. I think it's our nature. Ya Allah, did we really make it to Ramadan, the month of mercy, alhamdulillah? And then in the middle, you're just kind of adjusting your routine, seeing what worked, what didn't work, and now you're anticipating the last 10 nights. So I don't think it's necessarily unhealthy to have a peak and not a, not a dip, but a little bit of a steadiness in the, in the middle 10. And I think even the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu it has some of that, right? Like, you know, I imagine that when Ramadan started, all of the Sahaba were excited about it. And I, of course, they maintained the steadiness, but there was a difference between Rasulullah's practice on the 19th and the 20th, right? So I think it's natural. It's okay. We shouldn't feel guilty about it. We just can't be, for example, at this point now, not going to Taraweeh anymore, right? Like that's what I would consider an unhealthy dip. Like I'm going to stop doing Taraweeh or my Quran goals are not really working out the way I'm going to sort of ditch my Quran goals altogether and I'll wait till the last 10 to see if I can kick it up. I think right now you want to maintain a steady pace of everything and be as consistent as possible with what you don't want to lose in Ramadan. No. And that means maintaining your Isha, maintaining your Taraweeh, maintaining your, you know, some Quran reading every day. And then inshallah ta'ala, once the last 10 comes, we can we can boost it, get, it, get right into it. The Shirra, the peak outside of Ramadan is not like the Shirra in Ramadan, right? Like it's not the same baseline in Ramadan that it is outside of Ramadan. And one thing that I think is a very healthy thing to think about, the fatra outside of Ramadan is that you maintain your, your fara'it and that you don't um, do the uh, disobedience. So the lower point is that you never at any point, no matter where your religiosity is, abandon your oblig obligations or engage in the major sins. That's the way the ulama define the fatra. So the bare minimum and the shirwa, the peak, the bare minimum and the peak sort of go up in Ramadan, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that one helpful way to think about it is what are the mainstays of Ramadan? What are the mainstays, the things that I do that really should be a part of my daily routine in Ramadan? And how do I not abandon them? So I don't think anyone would say, for example, the fatra in Ramadan would be just keep praying your five prayers, mm. right? Just make sure you maintain your five That's prayers. That's not enough. That's not enough in Ramadan, right? Mm -hmm. So in Ramadan, you start to see, I mean, I'm, I'm giving the example of taraweeh just because it's so obvious. Taraweeh dips. I think it's healthy for people to say, you know, maybe I'm not going to stay up all night in the middle 10 nights, which, you know, you should start adjusting your sleep schedule to get ready for the last 10, just in terms of getting your sleep adjusted as much as possible to where you're starting after Fajr. But like, don't miss taraweeh. Mm -hmm. Like that, keep that as your fatra, that my baseline is I'm going to pray all the rak'ahs of taraweeh. Let's say, for example, you have a Qur'an goal, okay? Um, it would be strange, odd, to completely stop reading a portion of the Qur'an every day in the middle 10 days. So the fatra would then be, I mean, you could think of it mathematically, really, like, okay, when the last 10 nights come, I'm going to be doing, I'm going to have more time to worship Allah in the night. During the day, let's say I'm going to read half of what I plan to read, inshallah ta'ala, in the last 10 nights. So some people might have a khatma that they plan in the last 10 nights. It's a lofty goal. It's doable though, but like I'm going to do a khatm, um, you know, in, in the last 10 days of Ramadan. So what's half of that? 15 juz. Okay, maybe it's a third of that. Maybe I'm just going to keep my juz a day, my juz a day until I get to the last 10. The point is that in the last 10, <clears throat> you need to be building on something. And just like with Sha'ban to Ramadan, uh, the Prophet ﷺ said, that, that people become 
uh, heedless in regards to the month of Sha'ban. Why? Because it's between Rajab and Ramadan. The 10 days in the middle of the month are like Sha'ban between Rajab and Ramadan. Some people completely neglect it and that's not healthy because ultimately your baseline is going to give, you know, you don't want to, you don't want to be trying to get your baseline in the 21st night because the 21st night might be Laylatul Qadr. True. SubhanAllah. So you don't want to start getting adjusted on the first of the last 10 nights and then that turns out to be Laylatul Qadr for you. So your, your expectations should be adjusted. You've kind of felt your, your sleep schedule, what's working, what's not. You know, every year you also get a year older, so your sleep schedule is a little harder. But you know, every, every year your sleep is a little bit different. Um, maybe there's circumstances like children and things of that sort, right, that, that are keeping you awake or that are messing with you. So I think at this point now, your expectations in terms of your lifestyle, what you can handle and what you can't, are a lot clearer. And uh, you know, one advice, by the way, it's, I specifically give on the last question to sisters, for example, that might have to break from the tarawih and things of that sort, is still allocate that same time that you would have been praying tarawih to doing dua or to doing dhikr or to doing something else so that you don't lose the time. Because I think that the last 10, you're adjusting your schedule for the last 10. You've already gotten used to now standing up. You've gotten used to reading Quran, inshallah. But your schedule is what you're trying to adjust. Now, if you have work, you know your expectations. And that's where, that's where the hope part of the Sharia comes in. The hope part, right? Where you'll find narrations like from, I think it's Sa'id ibn Musayyib, I don't know if it's not him. I know it's an authentic narration from one of the Salaf that whoever prays Isha in the last 10 nights has caught the night, right? Like that, that counts as catching the night, as, as someone that caught Laylatul Qadr. If you prayed Isha in Jama'ah on the night of Laylatul Qadr, then you caught Laylatul Qadr. That's where the hope part comes in. And that's where a dhikr regimen comes in. So can you bring dhikr into your work life while you're doing some of your work? Can you bring a healthy regimen of dhikr into it? Instead, if you can't physically remove yourself from it altogether and work, what can you incorporate into your, your work stuff right now mm -hmm. that would keep you in a state of remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? The most underestimated ibadah in Ramadan is raw dua. And I really do mean that, that, you know, when I'm thinking about, just to be very personal, like I'm thinking about what my last 10 nights want to be, I'm like, I want to really make this one about dua. We wait for the dua of witr. We wait for, you know, to pray behind the imam and hope that the imam is going to have like an emotional dua once in a while. We wait for dua khatm al-Qur'an. Like you see people every year going around looking for the khatm Qur'an duas. But to exert yourself in dua, dua is worship. And to force yourself to allocate the time and eliminate the distraction. You see, dua is not quantifiable like the Qur'an mm -hmm. in terms of its nature. Like it's not like I have to recite this many duas. Like you have this many pages, athqar are even quantifiable, right? I have to finish the morning remembrances, the evening remembrances, but I'm going to give 30 minutes of unfiltered, undistracted dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I don't have to finish reciting any certain amount of things. I'm just going to give this time for dua. There is little that can be as rewarding as that. So raw dua, allocate time for dua. I'm not even talking about the athqar now. We know the, the virtue of remembrance, but truly dua, if I can learn to make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you know, establish an authentic connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through my dua, we all know that once Ramadan finishes, we're gonna have a drop off. We can talk about consistency, but it's also natural that the Prophet ﷺ did not do in the last 10 nights of Ramadan outside of the last 10 nights of Ramadan on a consistent basis either. But again, the baseline has to just adjust and not crash, right? But if you establish a meaningful connection with Allah in dua, you're not letting that go. You're not letting that go once Ramadan finishes. And SubhanAllah, you know, in these middle 10 days, Prophet Sallallahu said every night of Ramadan, Allah has people who he frees from the fire. Every single night. Every single night should have some of your tawbah, istighfar, seeking forgiveness, and every single night should have some of your dua. Once the last 10 nights come in, you just really grow that time and you really exert yourself seeking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with that dua. So I would say time for dua. If you can put aside 20, 30 minutes for dua. And I gave the Arafah example. There are some people that run out of their dua in the first hour and they're like, okay, I don't know how to make dua for this long. And there are some people, subhanAllah, that they, they get in it. They get in the zone with their dua 
And then it's like Maghrib came and they're still like, Ya Allah, I was just, I was just getting, starting to warm up, you know, right now. So that's the value of dua, that once you establish that connection with Allah Azza wa Jal and you start to realize like you are talking to the Lord of the world. You know how an amazing situation, I mean, if you're talking on the phone with the most beloved person in the world to you, who can't do anything for you, but you love that person enough, right? And you miss them and you're talking on the phone with them, you'll increase the conversation. You're talking to the one that you should love most and that loves you more than any other human being will love you and who can do anything for you in this life and the next, the one who has all power. Why would you shut the line? Like, why would you cut it off? What does anyone go to an important meeting with, you know, someone that, that they really want to meet, you know, a person of, of royalty or power or celebrity and then they leave first? That doesn't happen. So really learn to immerse yourself in dua because that will carry outside of Ramadan and may Allah allow all of us to establish a meaningful connection in dua this Ramadan that continues outside. But what I would advise myself and everyone else before you get into your dua and try to get in all your uh, your wish list before you get into your wish list talk about your hurt list. <laughs> this is Ya Allah I'm, I'm struggling with this. Ya Allah I'm, I need you. Ya Allah I, I need help with this. Ya Allah I'm, I'm desperate for your, for your forgiveness, for your mercy. If, you, if you're too proud, uh, that's what Allah says about dua. Those that don't make dua, Allah says they're too proud to worship me. Those that don't make dua. So there you go. That's your Ramadan goal. Assalamu alaikum Islam Box family. We need your support more than ever. Your support can help us continue to educate and motivate people to make and publish videos daily. Jazakallah.